Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. So some of you think that because somebody else does something better than you, that you're just in the way. Maybe you shouldn't do it. And God has not called you to that. He's called you to do what he's called you to do. And he has a purpose for you today. We're going to do a one book. We're going to study an entire book of the Bible today. It's also the shortest book. But we're going to study it. It's Philemon. And I actually found out that a lot of people don't know how to pronounce Philemon. They want to call it Philemon. Which sounds like you're from Philadelphia. I don't know why you, who taught you that. Uh, but I did hear a rap song that they used the word Philemon. Because it rhymes better when you say Philemon. But typically it's pronounced Philemon. But as any honest Greek scholar can tell you, we have no idea how to pronounce Greek words. So whoever says it first is right. <laughs> so just remember that. So here's what I want you to know today. And this is what we're going to talk about. This is a, a really interesting book. But we're going to talk about this. You are not useless. I don't know if you've ever told yourself that on a discouraging day. But the enemy loves to tell you you're useless, you don't matter, you're not important. By the way, he'll either tell you that or he'll tell you the opposite of that. That you're the greatest. Like everybody needs you. That's not good either, okay? But I want you to know, you are not useless. And as long as you are on earth, God has a plan for you and he can make you useful. You're gifted by God. You're here to refresh others. You can help the confined, and you can even encourage forgiveness. So today we're going to talk about three ways to be unusually useful. Now, Philemon is a very interesting book. It's a book about Paul encouraging a slave owner to release his slave. What's funny about that is, I just summarized the book for you, right? But there are people who use this book to say the Bible promotes slavery. Because it tells you to free them? Was that the promotion part? And so this book is very interesting. Typically when people talk about this book, they only talk about point three that I'm going to get to. They just talk about forgiveness where Paul is saying, I know this guy stole from you. This is what we believe anyway. Uh, stole from you, and I'll pay back whatever needs to be paid back, and I want you to receive him as a brother, no longer a slave. And so it's, it's the, the whole book of Philemon will take you about 12 minutes to read at the most if you read slowly and with intent. And so if you want to read it today, and then you can post on Facebook, I read an entire book of the Bible today. I'm so important. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, I, just, I just want to look at these three things. Number one, the first thing you can do is refresh others. So I'm going to remind you of what I said to the children, and here we go. Give me the sound of a nest tea plunge. Ready? One, two, three. Now, here's the thing. I had a 40-year-old tell me, what is that? I said, I said what? What's that? Yeah, you didn't have those commercials. So later, Randy, you can look it up on YouTube. Talk about feeling old. Like, like when I talk to a 40-year-old, I'm thinking, ah, we're about the same age. Until I say Nest T Plunge and they go, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I was a teenager when you were born. <laughs> I had somebody this week say, quit saying you're old, because that makes me really old. I'm like, well, my body's old, so there you go. Now, I love this. Philemon, and you don't have to put a chapter, so it's a little confusing. So you just write Philemon 4 through 7, which sounds like you're reading so much. But here we go. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. 
Your love has given me, listen to this, I love this, great joy and encouragement. Now, this is being written by a guy in jail. So it's awesome. He's getting joy and encouragement, which, by the way, should show you that you can have joy and encouragement anywhere. So I don't know what you're dealing with right now, but Paul says from jail, seeing your love has given me joy and encouragement. And then he continues, because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Now, this word for refreshed is the same word that Jesus says, I will give you rest. It's the idea of refreshment. It's not just rest like I will give you sleep. It's the idea that I'll refresh your heart. You ever been exhausted? You ever been in Florida and your cotton candy melted? I, I didn't... Re- By the way, I'm the opposite of you. I didn't realize that cotton candy didn't melt. Because, I mean, I grew up in Miami. Miami, you made cotton candy and the humidity took it away if you didn't eat it. You shove it in your pie hole as quick as you could before it disappeared into... And you'd have it all over you. Do you remember being sticky? That, that, isn't it amazing how you remembered that? And, um, and then they'd serve us watermelon and you'd get it all over you and disgusting. Okay, so <laughs> Jesus says, I will give you rest. And l- let me tell you what that feels like. Let me just give you an idea, okay? So we're a lot of us Floridians here. You've mowed the grass. You've worked in the yard. You've pulled some weeds. You've weed-eated. And let me tell you something about my life in July. I'm weed-eating. I suddenly am overwhelmed with how hot I am. And Kristen's sitting at the table studying. She's looking out the window and she can see our pool and she will see me like the Terminator just walk into the pool. (laughs) Glasses just float off my head. Fully clothed. I just walk fully clothed. Just grass. Whatever's on me. Just in the pool. Just. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, now because a moment ago I thought I'm going to die death is coming I had forgotten my brain quit working you, you, you've heard of, uh, uh, of brain freeze I got brain overheat and my brain said we're not going to pay attention to you anymore you might stop breathing soon I just, just walk right in the pool if any of you ever done that you've done the Anybody here done the Nesty Plunge? You've done? Thank you for showing your age. Thank you. I'm not going to ask who hasn't heard of the Nesty Plunge. You're killing me, Jessica. 1 Corinthians 16, 18. Here's a great verse. For they refreshed my spirit. Now, I love it. In the King James, it says uh, uh, like intestines or something. I don't know what it says. It's really interesting. But it literally means spleen. What? You've refreshed my spleen. Kristen, you're going to have to explain what in the world spleen and refresh have to do with anything. But anyway, it says, they've refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. So here's what that is. It's the idea that when you get around certain people, they renew you. Do you have anybody in your life like that? This is one of the reasons why I love small groups. Because if you get in a small group with people, rows are great. I'm so glad you're in rows today. You get to see the back of somebody's head. Don't pay attention if you're seeing less hair than the week before. Sorry, Troy. Okay, don't pay attention to that. But the truth is, the best way to be is to be able to sit Some of our guys this morning came in. They were laughing as they came in the parking lot. I said, did you guys just come back from breakfast? Yes. It's hilarious. They were having a great time together. And it was early. They should not have been so awake. Right? But what happened? They had refreshed each other. We forget sometimes. You ready for this? The reason some of us are discouraged is because we haven't gotten around people with courage. And sometimes 
when you're discouraged, you don't want to be around people. You've been there? And the truth is, can I tell you, that sometimes the very thing that you don't want is the very thing that you need? Why? Because how was Paul refreshed? By being in the presence of these other people. And not only that, he said, we should pay attention to those people. They deserve recognition. We should notice those people who lift us up, who refresh our hearts. And by the way, in a world full of the opposite of that, I mean, today people are upset that Chandler passed away, but I'm more upset that Moose passed away from Night Court. See? Bull, bull, not Moose. The other animal. Okay, I want to tell you why I called him Moose. Because when I was in high school, we had a guy who looked just like that, whose name was Moose. He was a football player and went to Harvard. Yeah. Sorry. But the truth is, depending on what we watch, depending on what we pay attention to, the truth is, we have the opposite of rest going on. Some of us are exhausted just from what we've seen this week, from where we've let our heart be pulled down and discouraged. And we need to pay attention and say, God, would you not only put refreshing people in my life, you ready, you ready? But for us to be those people. Jesus says, I will give you rest. And by the way, that word, I'll give you refreshment, the whole idea is he gives you rest for you to give other people rest. He doesn't give it to you for you just to hang on to. He doesn't give you rest just so you can go, ah. He gives you rest so that when you get around other people, they go, ah. Do you have those people in your life? Are you that person? The reason we want to spend time in God's word, the reason we spend time in prayer is to not seek God's hand. What can you do for me? What can you do for me? What can you fix? But to seek his face. God, I love who you are. God, thank you for all you've done for me. God, thank you for all you've created. And when we recognize how awesome God is, guess what? That, that rest begins to flow into us. And then when we get around other people, after we've received his rest, and received his refreshing, then guess what? We pass on the nesty plunge to all these other people. And how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as that person that people are like, oh, when they came around? Thanksgiving's coming, right? Do you already have somebody on your list that's coming to your house that you're already going by the way, if you don't, it's you. Just so you know. If you're like, I don't know anybody who's negative. Oh, no. I looked up six ways to be a Barnabas. A Barnabas is a son of encouragement. That's what it means, literally. Paul had that person in his life. It says this. For Kristen, I did not name any relatives. Just so you know. Okay. How to be a Barnabas. Provide materially. Look for material needs. Drop a line. Send a note of encouragement. Reach out and touch. Give a, give a touch. Pat somebody on the back. Give them a fist bump. You ready for this? I don't like the next one. Can I skip it? Take time to listen. Take time to actually listen to somebody. It's one of the most difficult things in our society. We are constantly distracted. We have beeping and dinging. And if a, if a cell phone does not go off before the end of the service, I will be shocked. Because that's the world we live in. It's not, I, mean, I'm, I don't freak out anymore. I'm like, yeah, that's how it was. I remember years ago going to a wedding and the pastor's cell phone rang and I thought, oh, how terrible. Now I'd be like, that was awesome. Did anybody get that on video? <laughs> Empathize. Pay attention to what others are saying and feel what they're feeling. And then finally, give your time. Give your time to people. Go out of your way to look for that opportunity be that refreshment number two helping the confined now what do i mean by confined i mean anybody who can't go anywhere 
anybody who's lost their freedom is combined. So whether they're in jail, whether they're in a nursing home, whether they're somewhere else, they're trapped, they feel trapped, maybe it's a hospital, right? Helping the confined. I love this story, this guy Leo Biscagla, but God, I totally mispronounced that name. Leo B., thank you, once told about a contest he was asked to judge. The purpose of the contest was to find the most caring child. The winner was a four-year-old boy. His next-door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the gentleman's yard, climbed into the man's lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked, what did you say to the neighbor? The little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. We all need somebody just to be there, just to be present, just to show up, just to say hi, just to check on us, and especially those who are in confinement, who can't get out on their own, who can't do their own thing. And so many, we have so many wonderful people at our church that take care of parents and grandparents and friends and go out of their way to do that. Folks who visit the jail, who check on people. Philemon continues, verse 8, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. See, I'm not the old, only one that considers myself an old man. That I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful to you and me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place, and listen to this, by helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. By the way, that's literal, not figuratively. Paul is in chains, most likely chained between guards. And he's in chains, what? For the gospel, for sharing about Jesus. And then he says, but I didn't want to do anything without your content, consent, so that any favor you do wouldn't seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. And I love this. Listen, no longer a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you as a fellow man and brother in the Lord. You know what's amazing about this? That, that Christians even missed. Paul demonstrates that this runaway slave was a person. And not only a person, he mattered and had given his life to Christ. He was a brother. It was like when Jesus said to his disciples, I call you friends. No longer are you just a slave. You are a friend. Paul does not look down on somebody that in their society they would have looked down upon. Paul said, you don't look down on He is what you are, which is a Christian. And as believers, as we look around, as we consider other people, as we consider what situations people are in, and by the way, don't you know some people that are in some tough situations? We should not look at them like I'm better than them because they don't have this part of their act together. But instead, we should say they're brothers or they're sisters in Christ. And I want to be here for them. How can I serve them? How can I take care of them? I remember being in the hospital and not being able to move and literally having a tube and being tied to the bed. It's just, you know, for an ADD person, that's right. You got it? I don't like to not move. And I remember my prayer went something like this after 20-something days in the hospital. God, I'm your vessel. And if you just want to put me on the shelf, that's up to you. But I'd like to be used by you again. There's a place of despair when we feel trapped. 
There's a place of despair when we feel trapped, whether it's in financial chains or physical chains or emotional chains. Some of us are trapped. And the truth is, God can use you to help other people that are in confinement, whether it's physical confinement or spiritual confinement or emotional confinement. We all know somebody who's in mental confinement, right? who's struggling mentally, going through something. And I want to encourage you, look for those people and say, God, how can I be a blessing to someone? How can I help the person in my life that's going through confinement, that's struggling? See, Paul in jail is blessed by Onesimus. And he says, this guy has blessed me. He has comforted me. He has been with me. He has helped me. How are we helping other people. I love this verse. Galatians 6, 2 says this, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And this is how we pray for people. I pray this very specifically sometimes. I say, God, would you lift their burden? God, would you help me to to either say something or do something for them that helps to lift the burden that they have? We all know burdened people, don't you? Maybe you are. By the way, one of the things I've also noticed is when you're burdened, sometimes helping someone else also lifts your burden. Don't forget that. Because the enemy will lie to you and say, well, you're too stressed out to help anybody else. Well, the truth is, you not helping anybody else may be part of what's stressing you out. And so it may be the smallest thing that you can do, but do that small thing, asking God to use it. Because when we lift the burdens of others, sometimes we find that the real burden that was lifted was ours. You know what I loved last night? I got to talk to the officer who was out here keeping everybody slowing down, slowing down everyone. It's amazing how those blue lights worked so great. I could see people coming down the road. So he came up after and was parked up here and we were talking for a few minutes and he said, you've got such a great group of people. He said, I can't believe how quick they're taking everything down. And I wanted to say, we're old. We want to go home and go to sleep. (laughs) But I didn't say that. I said, yes, we do. And I said what I always say, which is everyone but the pastor is awesome at this church. (laughs) Aren't you the pastor? But it was true. Because everyone helping each other made it where no one had to do all of the burden. And the truth is, in life, sometimes you feel alone, but you're not. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes you have to let somebody know that you need some help. Sometimes you're the one who needs to call somebody and say, hey, I'm just checking on you. And they may say, well, how are you doing? And you go, well, I'm struggling too. There's nothing wrong with that. But know that God can use that to even lift your burden. Listen to this quote. John Piper says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When you seek his face instead of his hand, you get refreshed. And when you get refreshed, you're able to pour that refreshing on other people. And when you've been running from God for a while and you're exhausted... Difficult to refresh others. So spend time with him. Number three, we can encourage forgiveness and restoration. Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story about a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son who had run away to Madrid. The father, in a moment of remorse, took out an ad in the local newspaper that said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. When the father arrived at the square in the hopes of meeting his son, he found 800 guys named Paco waiting to be reunited with their father. The truth is, there are so many people in the world that are looking for forgiveness. And there are so many people, we all have somebody in our lives that needs forgiveness. Now don't mix up forgiveness 
with allowing somebody in your life. Don't mix up forgiveness with allowing somebody to hurt you. Don't mix up forgiveness with allowing abuse to continue. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, I'm not holding that against you. I'm letting that go. It doesn't mean you're taking your car back to the same car place that broke it last time because you've forgiven them. Hopefully you learned your lesson. You go to Glenn's. This advertisement brought to you. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> Philippian, or Philemon 17 to 21. So if you consider me a partner, listen to what he says. Welcome him as you would welcome me. Basically, Paul is putting his, his hand on Onesimus and saying, hey, treat him like you would treat me. If he's done any wrong to you or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. By the way, most people thought Paul couldn't see very well, so he would have somebody writing, but there were times like this where he would write, and it was really big because he couldn't see very well. And by the way, even before Paul, even before Paul passed away, he talked about fake letters being passed around. Every once in a while, somebody comes to me and goes, I heard about this letter from Paul that other people haven't seen. I'm like, that's nothing new. Paul talked about it. So he actually signed these letters. Hi, I'm Paul. He says, look, I'm writing it in my hand. Knowing you'll do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me. I love that. Because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. One of the things about unforgiveness that I know is when we walk in unforgiveness, it's hard to bless anyone else. When you're walking in unforgiveness, it makes it very hard to love your family. If you haven't forgiven whatever fault your parent might have. By the way, as soon as your kid takes Psychology 101 in freshman year of college, they're going to figure out that you don't have your act together, so you might as well admit it ahead of time. By the way, before you go to college, we don't have our act together. They go to college and they go, Hey, you didn't have your act together. I, I can't tell you as a college pastor how many times parents of college students came to me and said, my kid came home and told me all the things I did wrong. I go, just wait. <laughs> they're going to, like Mark Twain said, they're going to suddenly get smarter. They'll come home their senior year and go, wow, my parents got really smart while I was gone. Paul said an answer to your prayer. You have to forgive yourself in order to love the people around you. Some of you are great at forgiving everybody else, but you've done some dumb things. And you have to forgive you too. You have to let go of the dumb thing you did, the dumb thing you said, the thing you wish had never happened. You have to let go of that and say, I can't fix the past. But God, you've forgiven me. Help me to forgive me too. Colossians 3. Bear with each other and forgive one another. By the way, that word bear does not mean uh, put up with. It doesn't mean put up with somebody. It's not like that video where the girl was like, you're in the way. By the way, some people feel that way all the time. I know some of you in here, you feel like you're in the way. That's the reason you don't help other people. Because you feel like you're in the way. You're not in the way. Do what God's called you to do. Just do it. It's okay. Bear with each other. And then listen to this. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We would not be a church today if I did not have people in my life who did the very things that are true in Philemon. People who came alongside of me, people who taught me about forgiveness, people who came along and said, I know you're hurting right now, but I'm going to be here for you. I'll never forget calling Harold Brantley and saying, Harold, I'm leaving ministry. I'm done. I'm done with all this stuff. And Harold said, really? Is that what God called you to do? I said, no. I just figure I'm done. He said, well, Eric, you know what you need to do? I said, no. He said, 
keep going. Keep doing what's right. Just keep going. Just keep doing what's right. And the truth was, that's all I could think of. I'm just going to take the next step and do the best I can. I can't say that I got every step right, but I tried to do the best I could to keep going and do what's right. Do you have anybody in your life who does that for you? And are you that person in anybody else's life where you tell them, just keep going. Just keep doing what's right. But this happened, but this happened, but this happened. Just keep going. Just keep doing what's right. But you don't know how they... Just keep going. Just keep doing what's right. I know some of you today feel like you're not only not useful, but you're in the way. That's not God speaking to you. God has you here for a purpose, and He wants to use you. And He can use you to bring reconciliation, to give people strength, and to refresh others. So ask him to do that. Look for those opportunities. Moment by moment, let him do that in you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. If you're watching online, I'd love to talk to you too about what it means that Jesus died for our sins because we all mess up and blow it. We need his forgiveness. And then what it means to take that next step and say, Jesus, not only do I want forgiveness, I want to follow you the rest of my life. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you. If you're here today and you need prayer after the service, I'd love to pray with you. If you're online, you can send us a note. I'd love to pray with you online too. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this book that reminds us not only of forgiveness, but also what it means to have somebody around us that refreshes us. Lord, may we be that for other people. Lord, I thank you for all the people in this church that not only refresh others, but look for opportunities to refresh those who are hurting, those who are trapped, those who are struggling. May we be those kind of people even today. Lord, I pray for a new refreshing that you would touch each life represented here with that refreshing right now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.